Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. Did uh, did you have a good time with Pastor Chad last week? He's he's always so great. He always comes so prepared. I'm rolling in the last minute, writing questions on my paper, borrowing pens and everything. So I'm glad Pastor Chad um, did good. And I, it looked like he kind of walked you through kind of an overview and gave you a little bit of the history of where Isaiah sits in the, the history of the Bible and everything. So I, I'm glad he did that for you because I'm supposed to, and apparently I, <laughs> I'm not done as great a job. So, um, But we are now on to um, Isaiah uh, chapter 43. We're continuing our walk through um, kind of the, the hopeful message of looking toward the future. So we're going to dive into that today. Um, but before we begin, uh, why don't we open with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together to study your word, um, to hear your promises once again, to to hear your voice as you speak to us, your people. We ask that you would um, be with us, open our hearts, open our ears, um, help us to receive the word and receive the promises and not to um, become hard-hearted and reject you and reject your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, So two uh, pieces of business I want to address before we dive into our study of Isaiah 43. Uh, First of all is an apology. I've got a chest cold and I've got a cough, so I'm going to try not to cough into the mic, but if I end up doing that, I'm sorry. Um, And then the other thing is um, one thing we're doing for our Trinity Matters for the fall. You guys get the Trinity Matters magazine in the mail once a quarter? So one thing we're doing for our next Trinity Matters is we're really wanting to get um, some... Um, testimonies or interviews, just talking about your experience, uh, different people's experiences with different areas of ministry. Uh, my area of ministry is Bible studies and small groups and things like that. So if any of you are interested in sharing your story, your experience, how it's benefited you, how it's blessed your faith walk, um, please let me know. Um, if you want to be in the Trinity Matters, then we got to do that soon because my deadline's November 1st. So that's next week we'd have to sit down and do that. Um, but just in general, if you ever have um, uh, something you want to share about your experience here at Trinity, whether it's with me and, and kind of the Christian growth faith formation aspects, or if it's any other area of ministry, um, we can sit down, we can uh, kind of, you can share that testimony and we'll find an appropriate avenue to share that with the people of Trinity or, or online or however that might be. So if you're ever interested, let me know. If you're interested specifically in getting featured in Trinity Matters, uh, here's your chance. You can, you can get your voice heard that way. So I just wanted to let you know you can catch me afterwards. But Isaiah 43, uh, does anyone remember what's going on? What is the, the kind of overarching theme of the chapters 40 through 55? What's kind of the m- movement? What is Isaiah talking about in this? Because up up through chapter 39, it's been kind of focused, very grounded in the world, and there's been a lot of judgment. But now the shift is something different. Did you have an answer? Well, I have some notes here that he's he's talking about prophecy, and he's fulfilling prophecy, um, that he's going to bring back Israel, even though he's judged them. Mm -hmm. Um, He's fulfilling... um, He's restoring Israel, so it's that prophecy that... So you're going to see him talk about David and then the Messiah. Mm-hmm. Um, and that they're the seed of Abraham. So he's kind of bringing the people back because they are his chosen people. Yeah, so it's prophecy and it's um, kind of talking about the return of the people and everything. And so the way I want you guys to think about it is um, that prior to chapter 40, it's really been grounded in this is what's happening now, dealing with kind of the judgment and the consequences of what's happening in the world. But Isaiah 40 and on is looking to the future. It's God's promises about the future. And we use the word prophecy. The whole book's prophecy, but the way prophecy gets used in our modern language, it's kind of a foretelling of the future. Um, and this is a section that is a little more of that foretelling. Here's what's going to come in the future. And you mentioned uh, the Messiah who would come. Uh, that's going to be the, our theme for next week. Um, we're going to really do a deep dive into Isaiah 52 and 53. 
I assume you've heard 53 read uh, sometime uh, about Good Friday. You heard that one before? By his stripes we are healed. So we'll, we'll dive into that next week. But, yeah. So doesn't he also, I mean, because they reverted back to the idol worship, he's kind of shaking it up with the rabbis, like, this is the way you believe, but now we're moving from, even though the Jews were his chosen people, we're now moving into the Gentiles becoming more of a predominant theme. But he's the Gentiles kind of getting their focus that away from, <coughs> when I say the sacrifices, that there's going to be one. Mm-hmm. I don't know about that so much. Um, a, a shift away from the old covenant to the new covenant so much. Um, there, there is a little bit of that, um, but idol worship um, has always been condemned. There's very specific condemnations earlier in the book of Isaiah. Um, and as far as like the sacrificial system, um, we are going to see kind of that movement from the Old Testament cultic practices into the New Testament and the promise of the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Um, and so Isaiah is preparing us for that. Um, I think perhaps we'll actually talk about that later today when Isaiah says, um, remember not the former things. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a pin in that. And when we get to that verse, let's bring that back up. It, it's your job to remind me of that when we get to that verse. All right. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. That doesn't matter. Um, in my Lutheran study Bible, uh, chapter 40 is the heading is comfort for God's people, comfort for God's weary people. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Jews were pretty weary back in the right. those days. Right. But the church today, as you all know, is the new Israel. So it's comfort for God's weary people, yes. even all of us. Yes, and that's what we can hear in this is... is when we're reading through the Old Testament, the first thing I want you to do is read through it and say, who was the original audience? Who was being spoken to originally? But we don't have these as kind of historical fiction or something. This is also very real in the lives of the people. And um, the preparation, when we're talking about the past and the future and the remnant shall return and everything like that, that's a return from the exile in Babylon. And... Um, I am not in any way the first person to think of this, but um, the more I've thought about it, the more I like this comparison, that the church today is very, very comparable to the people of Israel living in exile, that um, they were living in a world where um, miracles were infrequent, that they were living in a culture that was not their own, still trying to hold to their faith trying to hold to the promises of God in a world that is very antithetical to their faith. Um, and the more you dive into the comparison between what we're living through now and what the people of Israel went through in the exile, yeah, these are, these are promises that are going to hit ho home for us because we are waiting for those things. So that, that's a very good point to draw out. Um, and so as we're reading through this, yeah, we're going we're gonna to focus on the history um, and everything, but also I want you to be hearing these promises for yourself, because what is consistent across all of it is God. He's the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and his promises that he makes to a people who are suffering, to God's weary people, are promises that he makes to us weary people. They're promises, this is who he is, this is what he's going to do. And so even when you're reading narratives about, you know, Samuel or Solomon or all these Old Testament figures, the constant throughout all of this that I always want you to look for is who is God? What is God telling us about himself in these passages? And in that, what you'll start to see is you'll start to see the preparation for Christ. All of this is pointing us toward Jesus. All of this is preparing us to say, here is Jesus, because Jesus is the point of the whole Bible. The whole Bible drives toward Jesus, and then from Jesus, it's all looking back to what has he done for us, and how has he blessed us. And so th this is what I want you to look for, and this is why we continue to study the Old Testament. It is the Old Covenant. Um, it is the covenant that does not apply to us because we have the New Covenant that was bought for us by the blood of the Lamb, by Christ. 
But throughout the Old Testament, we see God promising Jesus and we see God working on behalf of his people and God's still God. He's still doing the same things. So that's the hope you have. Any other thoughts, comments, questions before we dive into chapter 43? <coughs> All right. Uh, our first reading, the, uh, chapter 43, gets divided up into kind of four major sections, um, about seven verses each. So our first reading uh, comes to us verses 1 through 7, and I'll read that aloud for us. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Sheba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. What do you hear in that? Hope, yeah. Hope, once again, captured by Isaiah's son's name, a remnant shall return. They're scattered to the ends of the earth. Because this is looking after the exile, after the people have been sent into exile, that Assyria has decimated and scattered the northern kingdom. And the southern kingdom has been pulled into exile. And now he's saying, I'm going to send them back. Do you remember where he's going to send them back to? What's, what's the place of hope? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And specifically in Isaiah, we talk a lot about the temple is on where? Mount Zion. Mount Zion. Mount Zion. And so this is, this is the, the idea of God's holy mountain where the temple is located, where he is located. And he says, I'm going to bring them back to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of fear about what's happening with everything going on. And to be fair, they should be afraid. Um, when you see the moments of judgment, it's going to be harsh. And what happens when Babylon conquers um, the southern kingdom? Here's the graphic details for you. Um, the, the final king in Jerusalem pretty sure it's Zedekiah, um, has his children murdered in front of him and then has his eyes gouged out. So the last thing he sees is his children being killed. And then he is um, brought into exile and lives a tormented life. So the Babylonians can show how effectively they have decimated Israel, that this is what we can do to your king. There's nothing we can't do to you. And to bring an end, they killed his children so that there would be no heirs, no one to claim the throne, so they could bring an end to this lineage. They should be afraid. And if you read through Ezra and Nehemiah, this is when they, the, the return happens, when the people return from exile, and the whole thing is fraught with peril, they're always in danger the whole time. They're trying to rebuild the temple. They're trying to rebuild the wall. And they have to have a conversation and they go, okay, here's what we're going to do. Everyone's going to bring their spear with them as a, and have a spear in one hand and a hammer in the other. Because we are in such peril that we need to be ready in that moment to defend ourselves. So yeah, it's pretty severe. And it's pretty perilous. But what happens? 
Do they succeed? Yes. yes. Why? Say it loud and proud. <laughs> because of God's promises. Exactly right. And that's, that's what Isaiah is driving us toward. Is what is your relationship to God? Are you going to listen to him or not? And the first half of the book really focuses on, you dummies, you didn't listen to God. So now you're going to endure hardship. You're going to face judgment and wrath, and it's going to be bad. But God is faithful, and God is just, and he is going to keep his promises in spite of you, and he will rescue a remnant for himself, and they will be a people who trust in him. And so it's this faithful remnant. But the faithful remnant really drives into the faithful one. And who is the faithful one? Jesus. So it's pushing us toward Jesus. Look for him because he's the only one who's truly faithful throughout all that goes on here. So yeah, Isaiah does have these glorious moments of hope, but it's also quite a drag sometimes. And we'll see that today. Let's, uh, let's look at um, these verses today. The first question, what images does God use in verse 2? And what are they referring to? So I'll read that for you again. God says to the people, uh, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. What does that sound like? Let's be literal with this. When you pass through the waters. Flood? Not quite. Through the Exodus, when they... Through the Red Sea. Moses took them through the Red Sea. So this is a literal callback to the Exodus because we're talking about the new Exodus, right? So we need to be aware of the Exodus that came before. God's going to lead them through the waters. Uh, He also says, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Does anyone know this one? So the Jordan was part of the thing going to the promised land. Yes. Exactly. So in Joshua, this is less well known, but just as impressive, they had to cross the Jordan River to get into the promised land. And it was springtime and the river was flooded and they couldn't get through. And God said, oh yeah, just send the priests in real quick. And they walk in and as soon as they, uh, they stepped in the water, the water started backing up. And it just kind of piled up while they crossed over on dry land. And then as soon as the priests walked out of the river with the Ark of the Covenant, okay, then we'll let the water back through. So God stopped the Jordan River so that they could go through there as well. And then these ones haven't happened yet, but they will. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. What's that? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? Throw them into the fiery furnace. Make it seven times hotter. It's so hot that instantly their bonds fell off them because they were burned so quickly. And the the strong men who threw them in the fire, who didn't go in the fire themselves, just got close enough that the heat killed them. They get in. I stand up. I'm walking around. This is kind of pleasant. There's someone else walking around in there with them. Nebuchadnezzar goes, something strange is going on. Come on out. The three of them come out. And so great is God's miracle that they don't even smell like smoke. I mean, when I sit close to a campfire, I can't get rid of the smell of smoke for weeks. They are in the middle of this fire and they don't even smell like smoke. Not a single hair on their head was burned. That's the power of God. This is who God is. This is the protector God, the saving God. This is what he wants to do for his people. He says, I am going to be with you. You're going to face hardship. You're going to face challenges. I've got you. I'm going to take care of you. Thoughts, comments, questions? So then what is God's promise to the people in this passage? He'll carry you through your trials. He's going to take care of you. He loves you. He's going to be your redeemer. And I want you to see (coughs) the word in verse 3. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. 
This word savior, the one who saves his people. It's a very strong thematic word and one I want you to, to cling to. All right, you guys ready to move on to the next few verses? All right, verses 8 through 13. Bring out the people who are blind yet have eyes, who are deaf yet have ears. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right and let them hear and say, It is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he, because no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Also, henceforth, I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Do you hear anything in that passage? What was that? I am God. I am God. <laughs> Powerful, demanding statement. I am the first and the last. There mm -hmm. is no other God. Yes, there is no other God. And really... Um, this passage is a condemnation of idol worship, as you brought up earlier. It's really a condemnation of idol worship that who are you going to trust in? Who are you going to look to to save you, to rescue you? I am God. Um, the, another point where he says, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. No one can rescue you. And so when he talks about bringing up people who are blind yet have eyes, who are deaf yet have ears, this is a reference to idol worship. And he says, all right, you can bring your witnesses to your gods. You can sit, ask them to tell you, hey, what have your gods done for you? What have your idols done for you recently? And in their blindness and deafness, they're going to say some pretty dumb things. Because there is no other God. And for this, um, I want you to reflect on 1 Kings, is it 17? Pretty sure that's right. Um, Isaiah versus the prophets of Baal. You guys remember this narrative? Don't worry, I'm going to tell it. It's a fun story to tell. So the people of Israel were living, this is the northern kingdom, that Israel, were living under bad king Ahaz, and um, he began the direct worship of Baal with, alongside his wife Jezebel. So this is where the northern kingdom is. God sends a con condemnation on the northern kingdom. There's going to be no rain for three and a half years. So then Elijah has to go and hide because Ahaz... Not Ahaz. Ahab. Thank you. Ahab. Ahaz is in Isaiah. Ahab uh, wants to kill him for this condemning word. So he goes and hides and we get stories about that. And then God says, okay, it's time. We're going to bring an end to this drought, but we're going to do so so that you know who I am. Because Baal was the storm God. He was the God who was supposed to send the rains. He was the God who was supposed to um, water the land. And God said, I'm bigger than him. I'm going to stop the rain. So God says, I'm going to send the rain, but you got to make sure they know it isn't Baal who sends the rain. So Elijah goes to Ahab and says, all right, we're, we're, the rain's going to end, but we got to prove whose God brings the rain. So we're going to have a competition. So they go up on Mount Carmel, which, by the way, was where the prophets of Baal claimed he lived. So this is Baal's home turf, and they set up a competition. Competition is you can prepare a sacrifice in any way you want, except you cannot light it on fire. And then you have to pray to your God, and your God lights it on fire. And of course, the prophets of Baal are like, we got the storm God. He's going to send lightning. This is easy. And so they set up this competition. They gather all the people of Israel together on Mount Carmel to have this competition. So the prophets of Baal, they set up their altar, they have this, and they 
get it all ready, and then they start to pray to Baal. And they're doing everything they can. They're singing, they're dancing, they're trying to get his attention. They're cutting themselves. They're doing everything they can imagine. And Elijah needs to make sure you know this is no accident that it's not working. So he gives them all day for them to do whatever they want. And it's not working. And he's over there going, you know, maybe Baal's on vacation. Maybe he's taking a nap. Could he be in the bathroom? You read it, that's what he says. And he's mocking them. And he says, all right, fine, my turn. So then he builds his altar, and then he digs a trench around it, and he prepares the sacrifice, and then he goes, go get some water. So they get water, and they pour it over top. Do it again. Do it again. Do it a third time. Third time. So much so that the water's flowing down off this sacrifice into the trench that he dug around it. And he's, his point is, no one can light this thing on fire. This is not an accident. You will know for sure that this is not an accident. This is no sleight of hand. This is the power of God. And then he prays, God, show them. Fire from heaven comes crashing down. Doesn't just set the, the sacrifice on fire. It burns so hot that it burns up the sacrifice. It burns up the stones of the altar and it burns the ground so much that even the water completely evaporated. In an instant, it's gone. You are now witnesses to who is truly God. You are now witnesses to the power of God, Yahweh, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob over and against the power of these blind and deaf and mute idols. And in that moment, Elijah says, you people of Israel, what are you going to do? Turn back to God. And Elijah then presided over the execution of all it's 850, 400 prophets of Baal and er, 400 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of Ashtoreth. He presided over the execution of all of them because they were lying to the people. They were pulling God's people away from him, the one who could truly rescue them, the one who could truly save them. They were lying to them and saying, trust in these false gods. Trust in someone other than Yahweh. And so God executed his judgment on the wicked men in that moment. And then... Elijah prayed, and the rains came, and it poured, and the land recovered. Now, there's a lot more to the story. There's a lot more to the story of Elijah. But, but this is what God's doing here, is he's saying, who are you going to trust? We're going to have a courtroom discussion now. Who are you going to trust? Bring your witnesses. Who can have the same power that I do? Because look at what I have done for the people of Israel. Look at my power to save. Can any of your idols even touch that? The answer? No. You've heard the evidence for yourself. And the evidence that gets shown time and time again. Because this is not just Elijah, think about what happened in Egypt when God sent Moses and Moses said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no. Moses said, you need to know who you're telling no to. And so time and time again, God does signs and wonders to show he is the one who has power. That the Egyptians, they're trying to trust in their gods the Egyptian magicians were actually able to replicate a couple of the first signs, but it got to the point where they're like, this is beyond us. We're not this powerful. Pharaoh, you should listen to Moses. But of course, Pharaoh refused. <coughs> and so the point that God was trying to say is, your gods can't stop me. You should listen to me. And the ninth sign, the one before the killing of the firstborn, is actually, it, it's this profound moment. It's one of the least disastrous signs of all. Does anyone know what the ninth sign was? What was that? Darkness. Darkness. Yeah, that's not very damaging to the people. 
That's why I, I don't use the word plagues. The Bible doesn't use the word plagues. Um, it uses signs and wonders because God's using these signs and wonders to show who he is. This isn't punishment. It's who's God. Does anyone know anything about the Egyptian pantheon? Who is the, the kind of top of that pantheon? Who is the most important God to the Egyptians? Ra, the sun god. So this last sign is the God of the people of Israel coming and saying, I'm going to hold your God captive. For three days, it didn't get cloudy and overcast and it was kind of dark. For three days, God turned off the sun. Your witnesses to who he is and his power. And now he calls you to make a judgment. Trust in him or trust in the idols. You're here. I know what decision you made. But this is what Isaiah is saying. He's saying to the people, you got to trust in God because if not, you're going to find yourselves on the wrong side of history. Thoughts, comments, questions? All right, let's move on to our next few verses. These are verses um, 14 through 21. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. So God's saying that don't, idols can't prophesy. Mm -hmm. So I can, and he talks about Cyrus 150 years before Cyrus, but who's telling this to the people? Who's talking about Cyrus to the people? Is it Isaiah? It's Isaiah, okay. yeah. So the, the, most of the prophecies you read here, it'll tell you if it's not Isaiah. Otherwise, you assume this is Isaiah speaking on God's behalf. Yeah, yeah. Because we know historically Cyrus is the one who is going to bring about the return. Um, he's the one who sends the people back from exile. So, yeah. I wasn't sure if it was God. Or <laughs> yes, yes. God's speaking through Isaiah to prophesy Cyrus because this is... I think the number is 150 years yes. before Cyrus. Correct. So this, his grandparents haven't even been born yet. Like, th this guy is, no one knows who this is. And yet God's going to mention him by name through Isaiah. Pretty awesome what God does sometimes, right? So, verses uh, 14 through 21. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake, I sent, I sent to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans and the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished and quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And the wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people who I'm for, whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise." How does God describe himself in this passage? It's right there, right at the beginning. I am the Lord, your Redeemer. We had that whole sermon series a few months back on the God, our Redeemer. Do you guys remember that one? And his promise is that he is going to redeem and he is going to rescue and he is going to save his people. But he's going to do it in a new way. This is what we were talking about before. Um, so he says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. Thus says the Lord. And then he kind of calls back the same things from verse 2, right? Who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. Who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. So what is that a reference to? Yeah, the destruction of the Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. So he's making the path for the people of Israel. And then he brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. Like he's leading them. Because he is.
but he's leading them to the destruction they have earned. And so they lie down, they cannot rise, they're extinguished, quenched like a wick. So this is what's happened before. This is how God has worked before. But remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, do not perceive it. I make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So before, he took the water and made dry land so they could walk through. Now on the return from Babylon, what they need is they need to be able to get through the desert, the wilderness, to return. How are they going to do that? You can't find water in the desert. Well, God can make water in the desert. So now he's going to take the dry land and create water for his people. This is who he is. He's not going to let anything stand in his way. His power will overcome all so that he can give all to his people. And so what he's saying here in this passage is, my people, I'm taking care of them. You listen to me. You follow me. You be faithful to me. I'm going to make it work for you. Thoughts, comments, questions? Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. That's right. It's going to be quite the challenge to follow God because you're going to live in a world that's going to oppose him and push back against him. You're living as a sinner. Our own nature pushes back against God. But we still be faithful. Yeah. Remind me, what was the question you were supposed to ask when we got here? <laughs> um, was it more about the prophecy of the Messiah? Or oh, yes. Draw us back to the Messiah. That's good. So remember not the things of old. Don't get latched on to what happened in the past because God's going to do a new thing. And this is part of the challenge that the people of Israel faced when confronted with Jesus. The Jews of his day, what was the challenge they faced is they had to let go of the former things and turn to the new thing. An example of this uh, is the temple in Jerusalem. <clears throat> you guys know when the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed? Oh, yes, 587 B.C., that is the, the, um, the original temple, Solomon's temple, was destroyed. Um, but I was talking about the one from Jesus' day, the rebuilt temple. What was that? 70, 70 A.D., yes. So the, the new temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. That's the more challenging number to remember. That's impressive. Um, <clears throat> but 70 A.D., so what happened is following Jesus over the next 70 years, the people of Israel kind of leaned more and more into revolt against Rome and Rome decided it's not worth it. We're not going to keep this kingdom together. So they came to attack and destroy the people of Israel. And what happened was it was the Jewish people who were clinging to this ideal of their kingdom and everything. Uh, they hunkered down and tried to defend the temple. But there were no Christians there. Because the Christians saw this coming and all of them fled from Jerusalem before the Romans got there because they, they said, we don't have to hold on to the former things. The temple has lost its power. The temple is no longer that thing of significance it was before. It has historical value. And in the restoration, it would make sense that God would restore his temple as well. But right now, where is God's presence? Is it just in the temple? When did it leave? On the cross, right? When Jesus died, and what happened when Jesus died? What happened in the temple? The curtain was torn in two. God came out of there so fast, he tore that curtain in half. So the temple no longer has that significance for the church because now the former things have passed away. God is doing a new thing. Now where is his temple? Say that loud and proud. The church. You're good. <laughs> That's the answer I wanted to hear, so I'm picking on you. <laughs> the church. 
is the temple. We are living stones. We are the temple. We are where God's presence is found in the world. And so now we have the responsibility. We are the new thing that God is doing. So don't cling to the old things. Don't cling to the old covenant because God did something new in Christ. And so now trust in him and trust in his promises. He is going to make a way. And he is going to take care of you. So I have a hard time giving the Christians this knowledge or insight that they should flee. Um, I don't know how many disciples have been tried and killed before 70 AD, but I would think that they're living everyday life in Roman society. They see the, the Christian persecution and they probably thought, and they are hearing the, the word, they're being preached by Peter and the disciples. So they probably think I should leave based mm -hmm. on everything they're yeah. observing and experiencing. Yeah. Like, how, how did the Christians know to leave and everything like that? But, I mean, they'd undergone years of persecution. Um, I don't remember say? when all of the apostles were killed. But I think a good number of them were killed before the destruction of the temple. Um, <coughs> We know St. Paul was killed under Emperor Nero, so that was before the destruction of the temple. Um, and presumably many more were also killed before then. Um, but Acts really follows Paul for the most part. Um, but we do have an Acts that James was killed. Um, he was killed pretty early on. Um, we do know that John was never martyred in that way. Um, he was exiled, and he was probably writing the book of Revelation and the Gospel of John in the 90s. So that would have been after the fall. And so he's going to have a different perspective than many of the other writers because he sees the dynamic shift that's happened since the fall of the temple. So just to kind of give you some of that history of what I can remember off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. uh, Josephus you know, recorded it as an eyewitness yeah. historian, and uh, Dr. Paul Meyer has translated the essential parts of his account so that all of us people speaking English can read it and yes. understand it. I highly recommend it if you're interested in going. Yeah. If you're interested in history, um, one of the, the best sources of information outside the Bible on the early church is Josephus's work. Now, Josephus was a Jew. Um, who he was in, in Jerusalem for the fall. And then he went, um, he was in like the last place standing. I, I'm trying to think it, if it was Medigo. I, I forget where it was. Um, Masada. Mas Masada, there we go. Um, so he was there. And um, when the Romans came, it was like, we're not going to get captured by the Romans. So everyone else made a suicide pact, where, but this, you couldn't commit suicide because, well, that was sinful. So then they just killed each other until there were a couple of them left. And he convinced the other guy, hey, let's not kill each other. Let's surrender. Um, so he surrenders and ends up becoming a historian to the emperor. And so is writing the history of the Jewish people. And included in this is this offshoot from Judaism known as Christianity. And so he provides a lot of information about from an, kind of an outside but almost eyewitness source to this is what happened with this whole Christian movement. This is where it came from. This is the history of where it's everything that's happened. So it, it's a very fascinating source to read. And if you, most of the time, if you're trying to get information about the early church, what you'll find is, well, Josephus said because we rely so much on, on his writings to know these things. Yeah. Part, part of that with Josephus also is the destruction of the temple itself. Yep, the destruction of the temple itself and what it... Paul was, as he called it, I think, two of the seven good wonders mm. that occurred at that time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. 
And signs and wonders, he's using that word because it comes straight from the Bible, right? Um, so, yeah. I think he was a that sounds familiar. Hmm. Yeah, I have not done a deep dive into Josephus. I just know by proxy, you know, reading the histories, see Josephus. <laughs> so. The Romans were so impressed with his, uh, with his uh, soldiering that mm -hmm. they saved his life. Mm. He just, he surrendered. Ah, okay. He became basically a hero of the Interesting. The uh, emperor's son, what became the emperor's son, Titus. Mm hmm. Yeah, yep. <coughs> so, yeah, lots of history, lots you could dig into if you want to. Um, but I want to um, kind of keep going. Um, and, and so we kind of answered that question, why does God tell the people not to, to remember not the former things? It's don't get lost in the past. Look for Christ and his redemption. Uh, but then let's dive into uh, verses 22 through 28. So God said, this is who I am. This is what I'm willing to do. Witness my power. But now, he says, yet you did not call on me, O Jacob. This is who I would be. This is what I would do for but you. But you did not call on me, O Jacob. But you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense. You have not brought me sweet cane with money or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. Lots of judgment there. But now he says, I, I am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us argue together. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. Your first father sinned. And your mediators transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary and deliver J Jacob to utter destruction and Israel to reviling. You didn't listen. I would have done all this for you, but you rejected me. So you've earned your condemnation. And that's the problem that still persists with the people, right? is it's the rejection of God. When we look at the book, uh, book of Ezekiel, there's a section in there where it describes clearly God's glory leaving the temple and then mm -hmm. leaving the city of Jerusalem. Yeah. And this coming destruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God's saying, I'm letting you get what you wanted. You don't want me? I'll step back. You can have that. It's one of the ways that God chooses to punish people is he gives them exactly what they asked for. Imagine if you got exactly what you asked for. It'd be kind of terrible. So this is, this is the call to remember. God is God, you are not. Trust in him because he knows what's best, what you really need. And if you ask him to let you have your way, he will. Ultimately, that's what condemnation is, is people saying, God, I don't want you in my life. And God says, you don't have to. But here's what it's going to be like. Being without God is hell, literally. One thing I wanted to point out to you, I forgot to include this as a question on your sheet, um, but I, I wrote it down for myself so I could remember to ask you. What is significant about not remember your sins in verse 28 or 25? It says, I, I am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Because he did it once at the cross. And yeah, he, he blotted it out and everything. And we're going to get to the cross. But there's an interesting thing that our translation, um, kind of the translation into English misses. But um, what you'll see is this is not the first time in this section he says not. 
So yet you did not call upon me, O Jacob. So let's count the times he says not. And I'm going to point out the times where your translation doesn't have the word not, but the Hebrew would have. Yet you did not call on me, O Jacob, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings. Here's one of them. Or honored me with your sacrifices. You could translate that. You have not honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings. I have not wearied you with frankincense. You have not brought me sweet cane with money. You have not satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. I'm counting on one hand, so I don't have enough fingers. Did you catch how many knots there were up to that point? Seven. Does the number seven mean anything to you? It's that divine number. It's the completeness number, right? This is a number God uses. There's seven days of creation and everything, and it's a number that comes up time and again. What does the number eight mean then? Seven is the days of creation, right? God made everything in six. He rested on the seventh. So what would the eighth day be? A new creation. What day of the week did Jesus rise on? Sunday. Sunday. What day of the week is that? What number? Because the Sabbath day, the day of rest, is the seventh day. So the next day is the eighth day. So this is, this is actually something the church has latched onto. We've recognized this n- number pattern in, in what God did is that God set this up intentionally that he, he rose on Sunday so that it would be the eighth day. It would be something new. It would be a new creation. The number eight in the Bible refers to Christ and the new creation. That's something that, that it drives us towards. Um, to, to kind of dive a little deeper into um, the, the kind of numbers of the passion, what day was Jesus killed on? Friday. Friday. What number day is that? Six. Six. Sixth day of the week. Uh, what was created on the sixth day of the week? Man. Man. And who killed Christ? Man. And Revelation tells us the number 666. It's a lot simpler. I can go into that sometime. But the number 666 is the number of man. That's what Revelation says. Six is the number of man. So six is the, an evil day because it's the day of sin. It's the day on which Christ paid for our sins and God himself was killed by man. The next day of the week is Saturday. Saturday is the Sabbath day. What did Jesus do on the Sabbath day? He rested rested in the tomb. And then he did something new on the eighth day. This is why the church gathers on Sunday and not Saturday, because we recognize that the significance is now on the eighth day. If you go to a church with uh, traditional architecture, usually their baptismal font is back in the narthex. Go look at one of those and count the number of sites. Anyone ever done that before? Anyone know the number of sites? Eight. Probably eight. I was going to ask if anyone wanted to guess. Eight. Eight sided because baptism is about making you a new creation. So the number eight is significant in that, that you are a new creation, that you have been renewed through the waters of baptism. God is doing something new. So God says here, condemnation, condemnation. You did not call upon me. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings. You have not honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings. I have not worried you with frankincense. You have not bought me sweet cane with money. You have not satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not, there's our eighth not, I will not remember your sins. 
Who is that about? That's about Jesus. That's about the resurrection and his restoration that he offers to you. You are not enough. You cannot be enough, but God, he keeps his promises. And he's going to overwhelm your brokenness. Yeah. So, so do we restart our week or do we, do, do we keep counting? That's a good question because most of the time we, we restart the week. Um, so the idea is that the resurrection is a new act of God. Everything else in the world fits within creation. It's all creation. But the, the idea of the resurrection is in the resurrection, God is going to remake the world. He's going to make all things new. These are the promises that we see in Isaiah, that we see in uh, other prophets, that we see carried into the New Testament. Jesus has promised he's going to make all things new. And so the, the eighth day is the, the new day of the week. God's adding a day to the week in the resurrection. So, so yeah, it's, it's basically the idea that the church has latched onto. What we recognize God did, really, is that on Sunday, God said, I'm adding a new day to your week. This new day is the day of the new creation. It's found in the eighth. And there's, there's other times, I, I love finding these because the commentary I was reading was like, oh yeah, the, after these seven knots, and I'm like, do you not see the impact of seven condemning knots of an evil world? And then the eighth knot is God's promise and his hope that he offers. There's other moments in the, in the Bible where you, you'll see Seven with the eighth being different. So, um, First Samuel 15, maybe 16. 16. Uh, Saul's lost his throne. He's lost God, his privilege as God's anointed one. God is going to choose a no, new king. So God sends Samuel to find this new king. Go to uh, the town of Bethlehem to Jesse's house. Uh, there you'll find the new king. So Samuel goes. And so, um, you guys know this story? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is um, Samuel goes to Jesse's house. And he's like, okay, who's going to be the new king? And God tells him, well, it's going to be one of Jesse's sons. And so Samuel tells Jesse, hey, bring your sons in here. So the f oldest, Eliab, comes in and uh, he goes before and, and Samuel's going, this guy looks like a king. And God goes, he's not it. So then, okay, and more sons. And he keeps going through all the sons. Anyone know how many sons that got paraded before him? Seven. Seven sons stand before Samuel. And every time God tells Samuel no, Samuel goes, anyone else? And Jesse goes, I mean, the youngest is out in the fields. And God, and Samuel hears God say, that's him. And so Samuel goes, we're not going to sit down till he's here. Go get him right now. And they bring him and he anoints him king. So David was the eighth. And who is Jesus? David's greater son. That's not an accident. <laughs> This is God trying to tell us something, that the eighth one is God's renewing work. God renewed the kingdom through David. David was a man after God's own heart. David was the guy. Because through David, you get Jesus. Through David, you get the one who would rise on the eighth day of the week. And in his rising, he would become your redeemer, your savior. It's there. It's all there. You read this stuff, and it's just so amazing to see what God does. So keep your eyes peeled, keep your ears open, and, and you'll see. God, God weaves these things in. All right, thanks, everyone. Um, as you see on the bottom of your sheet, next week we're going to get into the, the messianic promises of Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 53, 12. You're welcome to read the rest of it as well. Um, you can start at chapter 44. Go all the way through chapter 55 if you'd like. We'll see you next week.